morning, everyone. And welcome to our Sunday morning roundtable discussion. We are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. And we're so very glad you could join us today. Uh, I'm going to start with an announcement before we get into our morning prayer. Uh, the Bible study. The next one will be May 1st, which is, believe it or not, next Saturday. So May 1st, please make a note of this. Um, Linda will lead the discussion on Joel, right? And then May 22nd will be the next one, <clears throat> which Luann will moderate. And then the final one will be June 5th, which Tom will moderate. That's the first Saturday in June. Yay. And <laughs> yeah, Tom is back from his travels. <laughs> so anyway, and, and he's, do you know what you're going to do it on? It's not going to be on the disciples. We're going to leave that one until next Easter about the disciples' desertion of Jesus. We'll continue that next Easter. Do you know what your topic will be at Tom or not yet? No, no, not yet. But it'll be, yeah, hopefully something interesting. Anyway. <laughs> I'll look for something interesting. <laughs> I'm sure you will. All right, and then we'll take our summer <clears throat> summer break and adjourn again in September. All right, we will start now with our morning prayer. I'm reading from pages 195 and 282 of Divinity Course and General Collectania. Some special things Mrs. Eddy has given. He says, probation progress goes on until there is no life, substance, or intelligence in matter. And then she counsels, repeat the following affirmation silently several times each day, not with strained anxiety to get something out of them, but trying calmly to realize the meaning of the words. God is all, there is no evil, all is harmony, there is no discord, all is health, there is no sickness, all is spirit, there is no matter, all is joy, there is no sorrow, all is truth, there is no falsehood, all is faith, there is no fear, all is life. There is no death. All is love. There is no hate. We must cease quibbling, cease to admit in our thinking the reality and power in themselves of misery, pain, and evil in all its forms. We must think steadily and persistently the truth which stands opposite to them. We do in this way overcome our discordant conditions of consciousness. Mary Baker Eddy. Well, we could end the class with that. <laughs> Start and finish. That was beautiful. Thank you. All right. Our watching point. Watch number 105. Watch lest in using the word salvation, you accept the concept of traditional theology by letting in the, letting the notion creep in that you are to be saved from something, as if you were a sinner trying to be a saint, instead of a saint striving to know that you are not a sinner. One who is dreaming that a lion is about to devour him does not need to be saved from the lion, but awakened from the illusion. Man is already saved with an everlasting salvation, but he must be saved from believing otherwise and from the effects of this false belief. He needs to be saved from the belief that there is anything from which he needs to be saved, since in reality, God is all. Thank you. Comments on that? Well, I looked up the word saint and... Um, it means um, a person sanctified. And then I looked up sanctified and made and it means to be made holy, which is whole, perfect. And like 
um, Florence just read, we're already, we're already perfect. We're already um, good and everything that God made us to be. And so all we're, it's, it's really the illusion that we're not the, the denial of God's allness that we need to be saved from, but it's not anything other than just, we're already, we're already what God made us to be. And um, any denial of that is what we need to be saved from. But and are you absolutely certain that you are? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the whole yeah. journey, isn't it? We have to, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I, I, when somebody put it, we are to be saved from the ignorance yeah. that we are not perfect, immortal. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like, you know, open his eyes that he may see you know, what Isaiah, I guess it was Isaiah who said to his servant, or mm-hmm. we need to have our eyes opened to the present salvation. Yes, and our topic today, probation after death and the golden text, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. So it is this awakening process and The definition of salvation in the Webster Dictionary is the act of saving from danger or great calamity. So you see, there is the relative and the absolute. I remember um, Mrs. Evans speaking about the 91st Psalm, which of course... I find wonderful, as did Mrs. Eddy. I mean, ultimately, that that psalm is very relative, isn't it? No plague shall come nigh thy dwelling. Well, there is no plague, right? (laughs) All of it, all of it is relative. And this goes to one of the comments on the forum this week. And and all of you, thank you. Many of you answered that about well you know how about god knowing evil or if he's not to know evil it's that age-old question um again relative and absolute what florence read today from the blue book was what absolute absolute Absolute. that's a great safety we we know that we're told we should start with that Now, in that question that was asked on the forum, and again, thank you all for your comments, but I I am with Louise in that Mrs. Eddy's unity of good, the first few pages, she directly answers this. I've turned it to you many times to this. This is why we are told to study science and health, prose works, and the Bible All the answers are there. The question on page one, does God know or behold sin, sickness, and death? The nature and character of God is so little apprehended and demonstrated by mortals that I counsel my students to defer from this infinite inquiry in their discussions of Christian science. In fact, they had better leave the subject untouched until they draw nearer to the divine character and are practically able to testify by their lives that as they come closer to the true understanding of God, they lose all sense of error. The scriptures declare that God is too pure to behold iniquity, Habakkuk. But they also declare that God pitieth them who fear him, that there is no place where his voice is not heard, that he is a very present help in trouble. If he is all, he can have no consciousness of anything unlike himself, because if he is omnipresent, there can be nothing outside of himself. Now, this same, this self-same God is our helper. He pities us. He has mercy upon us and guides every event of our career. He is near to them who adore him. To understand him without a single taint of our mortal finite sense of sin, sickness, or death is to approach him 
and become like him. I don't know what more can be said about this, except God is all things to us. And I, I have said this before. He is what you need at the time. And certainly in these discussions, we speak both in the relative and the absolute. I mean, it, it's uh, you can say it about, you know, it says in Psalms, he that is our God is a God of salvation and unto God, the Lord belong the issues of death. Whoops. Does God know anything about death? <laughs> I mean, we can go back and forth with this. So just understand we speak in practical terms and what have many Christian scientists have done, which is really an abomination, is they take the absolute before they have demonstrated much of the relative. And, you know, they'll say to people that are sick, well, you're not sick or that, uh, you know, there is no sin, and this seems absurd, but there is no sin, so I can do whatever I want, because sin doesn't exist. So please, we use wisdom in what we do and what we say. And the relative and absolute are both necessary at this point. And I would certainly never discard the 91st Psalm, because it is written relatively, but we can, in our thought, bring it to the absolute truth, because that's true. No plague shall come nigh thy dwelling. Well, why not? Because ultimately, there is no plague. If all we needed was the absolute, there would be no need for the Bible, except for the very first sentence in the Bible. <laughs> There wouldn't be no need for the textbook because we will have learned everything there is to know. But we're not there. The absolute is the ideal truth. It, oh, is, must, yeah. it is the ideal that we hold in our th consciousness all the time. The relative is helpful in, in helping us get there. And as I think it was Florence just said, the journey there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and somewhere I couldn't find it, but I know Mrs. Eddy has said to, that she likes to think the old time yeah. understanding of God, that God that is your best and ever friend, that is with you, that knows everything about you, as I just read in Unity of Good. I mean, that is that is to me more the comfort of God. I know at one time I, I wrestled with because I thought it was almost a cold way to think of God as consciousness or mind or um, to some people that can be very helpful. And that that's great if that's helpful to you. We're all different and we all come to things differently. But please, if you study, truly study and not just skim over or sleep over Mrs. Eddy's works and the Bible, you will, you will grow and you will come to the right conclusions that are right for your journey, your steps. In the lesson, it says, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, Christ Jesus, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. What does that mean? You can't see it with your eyes. Mm, yeah, to some degree. Both your material senses, yes. Not with observing rituals and rites and all these other material <clears throat> ceremonies. That were part of the religion at that time. Yes, that's that's true. That word to observe is is to take notice of by the intellect, hmm. and also to keep religiously, as as Joe just said. It's not something that you're going to see outside of you as something apart from you. I think, too, I, you may have mentioned this in a previous roundtable, but you can't become a good Christian scientist by, you know, 
um, tithing to the church or reading a lesson every day or doing uh, attending church or doing all the material things without really making that covenant with God and getting your thought right. That's that's true. That was a stumbling block of the Pharisees, wasn't it? They did all the outward. They made their outward platter clean, but they were not living it. Christian Science, what, what was the one statement that Mrs. Eddie, Mrs. Evans said the only thing she got from her class teaching was one statement? What was it? Consistency. Mm-hmm. That, Intellectualism but, yes. is the bane of Thank you. Christian oh. science. <laughs> Intellectualism is the bane of Christian science. By observation, you sit back and just think this and think that and and study. I'm going to study. I'm going to observe all this stuff. It turns into my prayer. An intellect. My prayer chair. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah, your prayer chair. This is what kills it. Please. No, it has no heart to it. it. It is known to be this. Sitting in your prayer chair, it's it's all of this. And I can tell when people write things from their heart or when it is just intellectual pontification, okay? <laughs> and anyone can do that. You can study a book. You can quote. You can research. Anybody can do that. But if, it, if the heart isn't there, it's meaningless. There was an acid test to everything that we said and did in this church. And that was, it had to have the element of healing. Does what I write or what I say bring healing to the situation? That shows something true and real and of godlike. If it is just words and pontification, it's meaningless, frankly. From and the little, go ahead, please. No, I was saying it's from the little eye. <laughs> it's from the little eye. Yeah. It is human, and you can go round and round with does God know evil or not, or you can go round and round with these great infinite subjects and talk about it forever. But I don't know. Does that bring you any closer? Does that help you if someone were to call you with an urgent need? Would you be there for them? That is what is referred to as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Thank you. As it is. Mm-hmm. It's the old devil that takes us there. This, you know, and then, because I've had a few questions, you know, well, how do we know that, uh, you know, such and such? But Mr. Seti herself says that this mortal existence is an enigma. And so do we need to spend so much time analyzing these things or take the truth that has been told and rather, you know, live with it, practice it, make it our own. Thank you. Yes. 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 I had someone once, I think she was calling me from Ireland. She called me quite often with these intellectual questions. And no matter what I said, but she had another question. <laughs> and finally, just said, please read the textbook and study prose works and let it unfold. This, the next sentence, you know, after it, it doesn't, it does not come with observation. And usually the people of, who observe end up being very critical too. Oh, look at, look, well, they're not demonstrating. Well, uh, you know, and they're not doing a darn thing themselves. They're just sitting on the sidelines observing, Right. We see it everywhere. And God forbid when we get intellects in our government who've never done a darn thing. All they've done is read read about it, okay? But they haven't been out in the work field. They don't know what it takes. They don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. And yet they, they think they do because they've read about it in a book. As I've said, you can read math till you're blue in the face. But if you've never worked out a problem, what good is it? Well, it's true about science, too. You can read and read and read. You can read every book under the sun. You can quote and quote and quote. But if you haven't lived it, it's Zippo. The next part of it, 
Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. That means it unfolds within you, that kingdom of God. It's unfolding. God is your teacher. Hey, you know, the Bible says that. Is that relative? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but I know it to be true. All oh, the- yes. Go ahead. No, there's something Mr. Said is wrote said too. Students expect more and more teaching. This is the work of the evil one. God alone teaches. <laughs> he says you. something to us all. Uh, he says something to us all every hour. When will they all awake to hear his voice and stop looking at, looking to me? I thought, Amen. Thank you, Florence. <laughs> Perfect. I don't know you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. In your daily experiences, he is teaching you. He's talking to you. You don't need to read a book on it. Now, I'm not knocking, studying, looking words up. I've said that that can be great. It can be very helpful to you. Um, if it prepares you for the divinity course, which is if it helps you listen to what God is telling you, if it brings healing to your life, it's useful. Now, I'm going to say, too, that the forum, the, 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 they're getting longer and longer, the answers. And I know Florence has spoken to this. It doesn't need a long, long. You you might research and study, and if you find helpful, that's good. Then just take one aspect of it that was healing and helpful and and post that. Because otherwise, you know, we're just getting volumes of things. Um, An example, I think, is a good post because I have kept this post for over a year in, in my notebook It was written over a year ago, and it was by Melinda. And she wrote in the blue book, Martha Wilcox is quoted saying that one of the first lessons she learned in Mrs. Eddy's house was that the objects of sense, when correctly understood, are really ideas of soul. And that's a quote. There are not two groups of creation, but just one. So in reality, there is no material world apart from the spiritual. And then she says this, Melinda says this. Whenever we go out, we can declare that we only meet spirit today. Whatever and whoever we come across, whatever we touch, whatever we hear, whatever we see, whatever we receive is spirit good, is already approved and blessed by God, and can only bless us. Be prepared. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. And I've kept it all these months. And I think of it often. She took the words of Martha Wilcox. She made them her own. And it was just a great blessing. And, you know, think of that. This is the answer to all this pandemic stuff. (laughs) Whatever we touch, whatever we see, whatever we hear. And she knew she was doing that. That was written of March and last year. It's a beautiful treatment, and it rings true, and it's healing, okay? It heals, doesn't it? That's what we were looking for. Not words and words or, you know, research and research. Some of that is helpful. I'm not knocking it. You can do it for yourselves. I, Looking up words, I do it myself a lot. But then bring it into your own experience and make it into something healing and hopefully not so long. Lawrence, do you want to speak to that? Well, yeah, because sometimes um, if it's so long, then I can't even use it in the post. Uh, you know, it, it's just, esen- just the essential thing, because remember also the forum highlights really go to people, um, some some are, older and all that so just something simple that they can read understand and practice is very important yeah thank you and you know this these round tables are bible studies too the purpose of them is 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 teaching in a way to let people know the correct understanding of christian science 
It's also, and the main thrust tr truly should be healing. Many people come and they're in dire straits, physically, emotionally, and they are looking for the healing touch of the Christ. And that's true when they come on to the forum. They're looking for the healing touch of the Christ. And I, I have observed, quote unquote, <laughs> that the most, shall I say, popular roundtables or even forums are those when that healing word is spoken, like Melinda gave. That's why we all come, especially in the beginning. So let's not lose sight of this. And whatever you say, that's why in your testimonies, you know, bring something to that's going to heal someone. And you do. There, you do. But in everything, that healing element, Mrs. Evans would just throw out anything that was intellectual that she knew had no heart in it. And that was a good, it was good, should be. So we keep that high standard. We're here to bless a weary world. So remember, the kingdom of God is unfolding within you. And God is your teacher. You're receiving every day all that you need to learn more of him if you turn to him. It's wonderful. This science is so complete. And we don't have to worry about things actually that don't even concern us right now, you know, with some intellectual, well, let's, you know, discuss all this when just prove what's been given to you today. And then fermez la bouche. <laughs> <laughs> Shut your and mouth. Who knows what that means. Yes, thank you. <laughs> knows what that means. Yes. Just quiet yourself. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. An intellectual pursuit. Thank you all. And thank you all. I'm always grateful for your forum contributions. Yes, but from the heart. And here we are. So because people were writing, well, they didn't even really know what probation after death means. So my goodness, what does it mean? <laughs> what is what what does probation mean? Trial, examination. Mm -hmm. Approving time. Yeah, it's a time of testing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And does a day ever go by when you're when when you're not tested? No. No, no we're we're going through a proba probationary time right now, aren't we? <laughs> well, that never stops. Your your body, mortal body, may stop. But your life never stops because God is your life and God never stops. And we will never stop being tested until we reach perfection. And we wouldn't be tested to reach perfection if it weren't possible. Right? And we can say, well, this belief that we're not perfect now is just an illusion, right? That's what their watching point was about. We are perfect now. But again, it is a matter of living it and demonstrating it. And you can. And truly, you can have heaven on earth when you're doing this. Because heaven is not a location, right? No. Stay mind. If I were to ask all of you now, do you, are you experiencing heaven on earth? What would be your answer? Sometimes. <laughs> more and more all the time. Right answer. <laughs> and that's a blessing of Christian science. That's a blessing. We shouldn't be in hell. If we are in hell, then, then just quiet yourself and let God teach you what you need to learn. Don't fight him think you know it or are mad at him for your so-called experiences or who did what to you and and blaming god usually hell is a state of blaming god very often it is yeah and that's what it means in psalm 68 in the lesson he that is our god is the god of salvation and unto god the lord 
belong the issues from death, not the issues of death, but the issues from death. What is it that dies? Mortal sense of that life. Alive. Thank you. Yep. What did you say, Craig? Oh, the material beliefs the same. Material yeah. beliefs. That's all that can die. That's all that's capable of dying. But they never had any life anyway. <laughs> any life anyway. So I'm giving you hell. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That is gone. Yes. Yeah. There was something beautiful I read. I meant to bring it, but it was, I think it was the last, the last thing Mrs. Eddy wrote in the blue book. And it was about, um, well, all these things were not true because they were godless and Christless. If it's godless or and or Christless, it's not true. And it's nothing to fear. Certainly nothing to worship. It's nothing to dwell on. Nothing to analyze. Nothing to analyze. <laughs> yes. Because because of that. Only that which is godlike and Christ like is true. So we have this continual, yes, probation, and it goes on true after death if you are well, it goes on forever, as Gary said, until we reach perfection. Um, and so why not do as much of this as we can now? And if we're experiencing heaven on earth here, we'll surely be experiencing it later. Mrs. Eddy has said that um, she talks about that in Unity of Good, too. The second death um, will have no power meaning this sort of mortal so-called death, because if you've done the best you can in this life, your rewards will only increase as you pass through the portal, so to speak. <laughs> and you'll, your understanding will increase. Well, certainly you'll know that nothing killed you because you're still alive. And a lot of people have written about this, haven't they? Mm -hmm. They've experienced passing through the portal and then coming back mm -hmm. and they've written about it. And who knows how many people have experienced it and haven't written about it. <laughs> yeah. Like Luann. <laughs> well, she tells us about it. And I had, I had a nephew too who had experienced it. And, and, you know, he is, he is, there's a piece about him. Because he knows there's no such thing as death. It's kind of... So he doesn't fear as, many, as much as many people do. Yeah, he does not. So, so why not now learn as much as you can? And also to know that because what is the belief? People think that death is going to relief, relief them, relieve them, or release them. Um, but no, you'll still have the same things to meet. I'm sure it is always helpful, though, to know that whatever you thought was so horrible that was killing you was not because you're not dead. <laughs> OK, that's a great growth. But you can know that right now. OK, why not know that now? Only thing that gets destroyed are false beliefs. Don't hang on to them. Don't hang on to those grudges. Don't hang on to feeling People did you wrong and that or God wasn't good or why did you have this experience and other people didn't and yada, yada, yada. As I've said, if that's helpful, I'd say do it. But you know darn well that's not helpful. And if you I, read, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh -huh. I, the, the, one of the statements in the lesson this, that goes that was so helpful to me. I almost put it on the post this week, but the statement that no final judgment awaits mortals for the judgment day of wisdom comes hourly and continually. 
even the judgment by which moral man is divested of all material error. That just was like a relief. It just popped out of the lesson this week. And it just, it, it really, every hour, we have the opportunity to do everything that we're talking about to say, I'm, you know, anytime we, we see a little bit more of our spirituality, our perfection, that, that's what this, we have every day where there's no, there's nothing waiting for us at some future. It's going on hourly and continually. And I don't know, I, I, I felt a comfort in that. Um, because to think that there's some future date that we're all going to be big judgment day. It's, so many people think that, that really it's going on every moment of our lives. And to me, that was a comfort. And it should be a great comfort to all of us to know that God gives us opportunities every minute of every day to know him better. And as we grow, we will attract situations that need healing that we are able to help. People will come into your life that you will be able to help when you're ready to help them. And the situations that seem to be pl plaguing you or have come into your individual lives, you, you are ready to meet them or you wouldn't have them. It's just like we've been likened to taking the exam at the end of the year, see what you've learned. It shouldn't be a time of great horror, <laughs> <laughs> although I do admit exam time was a great <laughs> <laughs> But, but we have exams every day, don't we? Yes. yes. I mean, if we accept them as such. And you know what Peter said in the um, citation, I think it's uh, 7 and First Peter, the trial of your faith is like pre more precious than gold. That's such a beautiful thought. To not be afraid of any trials that you're faced with, but to look at them as really golden opportunities. Thank you. That, thank you. And that's the way that's to exactly look at them. That's exactly right. And, and rather, that, rather than look at them as problems that worry you or you hang on to or you the avoid, fear, or you avoid, avoid them, whatever, exactly. No. God's given you an opportunity to work something out. It makes you so terrified you can't even think. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. and, and what did Paul say? He said he he rejoiced in infirmities. Mm -hmm. Yes, and tribulation. And tribulation, yeah, because those are the things that forced him closer to God. And what could be better than that? When when life deals you a lemon, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, you know, in doing that, you diffuse it, you diffuse it, you turn it around and turn it into something good. And that, that's why Mrs. Eddy says, even if you were to fall down and break your leg, what do you do? Get up. Get up and Get declare up. the truth. Yep. I am the better for this. I'm, yes, thank you. I'm the better. For, this would only make me better. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. You say, this, this came to me so I can learn more of you, dear Lord. And that's what I'm about. I had heard this was a minister, but I thought this was very healing where he said, friend, when the Lord calls you strong, don't declare yourself weak. When the Lord says you are forgiven, don't dwell on your sins. When the Lord says you are righteous, don't see yourself as guilty. That's it. <laughs> yes. It was very beautiful. Remember what God is saying about you, and don't declare otherwise. Declare on the right side. Really, with so much gratitude, should we receive it? It's like, why are we take so long resist? Anyway, what is it? The, <laughs> hypnotic, <laughs> the hypnotic nature of that, oh, you know, the lie. But yeah. otherwise, such wonderful... Uh, you know, we're leaving behind so much, such a grand 
heritage that we are not taking advantage of. Yes. And what 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 was your thing about resistance that you? Oh, Laurie Sargent said that um, non-resistance to truth is understanding. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Which I love. <laughs> yes. If I don't understand something, it means some part of me is resisting. So I got to let that go. Thank you. And also in the blue book, um, self-justification will keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Mm. That's fun, right? Think about that. So if you're not experiencing the kingdom of heaven, maybe you're full of self-justification. And in what way would that work? Argue for your error, sin, or problem. Thank you. But I'm doing everything I should. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why is this so long? <laughs> Adam and Avera, Mrs. Edison's. Thank you. Thank Great. you. Adam and of Aaron, what is that? Big block. <laughs> a big block. I can't go beyond this point. Self justification. Yeah. Self will. Self will. Self love. Self love. And there's a whole bunch, bunch more of all those self things. Those are the little eyes, as, as Florence. <laughs> and they will keep you out. I thought, wow. It's really one to think about. If you don't feel you're there, then maybe you're full of all that. And yes, you can add more self-pity, um, self-grandeur, self-righteousness, all I those selves. In the Brown book, Mrs. Eddie does have a list of all those. She does? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can post that. Self-pity, self, all, all, the, all the self, she says. <laughs> Self-importance. <Yeah. laughs> and, and all that is a selfhood apart from God. Yes. And that has to be done away with. And if you don't want to be doing away with it, then okay, then just take your lump. Live in the Adam dream. <clears throat> but don't say you're a Christian scientist and don't say that Christian science doesn't work. His, his laws must be obeyed. And I thought there were two things that struck me. One is that um, give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of of feigned lips. What does that mean? Yeah. You know, you can you can make all these statements and stuff, but you're just if you're lying through your teeth, <laughs> then don't <laughs> expect God to hear that. You can say, Oh, I'm I don't love Aunt Tilly or I don't hate Aunt Tilly anymore, but really you do hate, hate Aunt Tilly, well then and then the other was, um, <clears throat> but God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Again, from your heart, not coldly from your intellect, but obeyed from your heart. And then when you're obeyed, obeyed from your heart, this doctrine that's been delivered you, just as Florence said, why do you resist it? accept it a lot of this is receiving one was it last week there was a lot about receiving the truth you have to receive it or i know it's about the receive you're the image of and likeness of god you've got to accept these truths you can't argue with them or think well why is that that again that's your stupid intellect <laughs> that's why in the watches it says going out to the receptive hearts yes and then it says you're made free from sin and you become servants of righteousness. That's how you get freed from the sin. By obeying with the heart. You stop resisting all these wonderful truths that God has said about you. When he calls you strong, you don't say you're weak. When you say you're forgiven, you don't think about your sins. And when he says you're righteous... You don't see yourself as guilty. And there's almost an immediate <laughs> reward for that. And I used to say about in, <clears throat> in church, it's the peace of God that passes all understanding. Thank you. And, and <clears throat> people may remar marvel at it. You know? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Yep. And, and, when, and when you feel that reward, <clears throat> don't think that it's too good to be true. Yes. <laughs> don't think, oh... Gee, this is great. Now, when is the other shoe going to drop? 
<laughs> right, right, because that is the human mind. Because you're make, you're being made free <laughs> from mistaken beliefs, which is what sin is the result of. Yes, and then it says, and once you've been free from sin, because you're obeying from the, your heart and accepting and receiving these blessings, then what happens? You become be servants to God. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Lil. <laughs> it's right there. You become servants to God. You become his servant because you're so grateful to him and you realize what's happened and you're free from all that false belief and pain and sorrow and sadness, free from the Adam dream. And so then, yes, you become his servant, willing, willingness to do whatever he would have you do. And it's a happy thing. It's a happy yeah. thing. Yes. The fruit, right. The fruit of hope unto holiness. Yes. A happiness that nobody can ever take from you. Yes. That no circumstance can ever take from you. Yeah. Okay. And then and then you experience and realize eternal life. And forever. For yes, everlasting ever. life. Exactly. And that word holy, because later it says, you know, be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And who is the I? God. Yes. God. A man is more or less holy as his heart is made pure from evil dispositions when his heart is conformed to some degree to the image of God. We will awake in his likeness. It's nothing you can do humanly, my friends. You can't make it happen. It's, it's your willingness and your deep desire to love and obey and know more of him. And then it just happens. And don't you see it? Don't you see in some faces? I mean, you see it in the face of a child, right? The image of God. Yes. The purity, the holiness, the joy in their eyes. Because they haven't been brainwashed yet mm -hmm. to think otherwise. And we see it, we see it in, in people too, you know, very often. It used to be people could tell a Christian scientist, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and and why? <laughs> the love was there. Yes. Florence? I said there's something about their whole, you know, approach, the whole presence, really. Thank you. There is. A peace. A peace. Something calm. Calm. It's a calm. It's a light. A light. And it draws. And it attracts. When, well, uh, <laughs> people come to me at work uh, during the, they're doing layoffs for every year and kept going on and on and and saying you know how do you stay so happy or and happy or and positive you know i realized it was a, it was a, the daily blessing that we had that always refilled you with the sense of you know god's plan was good it was happening now thank you thank you yes and and you know, Craig does have that light. Those of you who have met him, you see that in his face. And it's a kind, loving face. It's a light with, with God's love. And, you know, Gary gave his testimony about waking up in the morning anxious. Well, we were taught here in the morning our thoughts are like sponges. You know, we can, especially if we've gone to bed with any troublesome thoughts, we'll certainly wake up with it. That's why we pray, clear our thought before we go to bed. But it's also why, first thing in the morning, what should you do? Clean it. Only one mind. Yes. One mind. God is like one. And that, that connects you with your thoughts. There's only one mind. We don't have a mortal mind. There's no carnal mind. There's one mind. That mind might have seemed to have been tarnished because of all the harshness 
of the day, the noises, the materiality, but there's just the one. You keep it polished and clean and get your thoughts from that. And also to know that God is your life. And Linda wrote about that in in the forum. But I was, I was going to read. This was a very beautiful, I guess it's a testimony that Carrie sent me. Um, and she's speaking, I think, to her sister who was in dire straits. I, I won't read the whole thing, but it was a Christian Science Treatment, Journal 1889. In the last paragraph, she writes, My first upward step out of darkness into light, out of sickness into health, was through persistently affirming for three days and nights, God is my life, God is my life. At the expiration of this time, the symptoms, were, as we measure physical conditions, were worse. I would not allow this to move me, but continue to silently declare truly, God is my life. For four days more, then there came a perceptible change. From that on, I slowly but steadily improved until those who were opposed to Christian science, learning I had repudiated the old ways, rolled upon me their opposing thoughts. This maybe you cannot comprehend, but someday you will. With this came the help, the need of help, for I had no understanding of animal magnetism. And with help from a scientist, victory was again reached and then resumed the work alone. Through all this time, some weeks, I never ceased to affirm my place. And the healing came. Yours in triumph of Christ. And the whole thing, it's a beautiful article, and it also quotes... Um, Mrs. Eddy, about declaring daily, you know, your oneness with the Father. <clears throat> so we're going to end now in miscellany, Mrs. Eddy's short article called Heaven. Heaven. Is heaven spiritual? Heaven is spiritual. Heaven is harmony, infinite, boundless bliss. The dying or the departed enter heaven in proportion to their progress, in proportion to their fitness to partake of the quality and the quantity of heaven. One individual may first awaken from his dream of life in matter with a sense of music, another with that of relief from fear or suffering, and still another with a bitter sense of lost opportunities and remorse. Heaven is the reign of divine science. Material thought tends to obscure spiritual understanding, to darken the true conception of man's divine principle love, wherein and whereby soul is emancipate and environed with everlasting life. Our great teacher hath said, Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Within man's spiritual understanding of all the divine modes, means, forms, expression, and manifestation of goodness and happiness. Mary Baker Eddy. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.